in its fullest sense is whatever your front line is, whether I look for our, for many people, it's internal first. Mm-hmm. Your own front line. You challenge that with your information or your conversations. And then once you get outside of your own way, now it's what do I do next? What do I do at my dinner table? What do I do in my community? What do I do in my classroom if I'm a teacher? What do we do in our in our school district? So whatever your front line is, is just step up and start to analyze and understand that I'm here as an active anti-racist. And if I see racism or feel it, I'm going to question it. School is in. But are you really ready to learn? Open your eyes to a new day in education with The Awakening Educator, a program specifically designed to explore a new mindful way of educating our youth. Learn about social-emotional learning, new modalities of teaching, and the most relevant topics in education with your hosts, Susan Andrian and Megan Sweet. Susan and Megan will take you inside the issues by looking at them from different points of view. From policies and research to teaching models that are actually used in schools. There's never a dull moment in this classroom. Have any questions you'd like to ask? Maybe you have knowledge you'd like to share. And share your thoughts live on air. Grab a pen and paper and get ready to open your textbooks and minds to a new way of learning on The Awakening Educator. I'm Susan Andrian. I'm Megan Sweet. <laughs> and today we have Kyle and Kamal with us of A Long Talk, and I'm going to let them introduce them themselves. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to who wants to go first in introductions here. Um, I, I'll go first. So I'm Kamal, um, Kamal Carter, and um, I, I met Kyle many, many, many years ago on, on Hampton University's campus. And um, just um, I'm, I'm a father. Um, uh, activist, advocate, um, just someone who wants the world to be a better place for all of our kids and for um, just for every every human being on the planet. And I, and I believe that that in order to do that, we have to have these conversations that have been ignored or whispered and, or just not even addressed. And so um, I'll kind of share a little bit more as we get started on kind of how I met Kyle and how we work together. But I'm here to to form a more perfect union. Hmm. Thank you, Kamal. Um, I'm Kyle Williams. I'm from um, from Plainfield, New Jersey, the birthplace of P Funk. I get that in. Um, <laughs> I'm, the, I'm a father of three. I'm the son of many. A community. Um, I'm a child of hip hop. Um, I'm a black man in America trying to make it a better place for my sons and for my and for my community. And so. I, I, I want to thank you guys for having us here, but I think you know this. This is about being able to to meet and talk to people just like you. You know, so I, I'm just a person that wants to have this conversation. The best introduction for me is just to know that I'm here um, to have the, a conversation that we can that we believe can change the direction of of, of race in America. Yeah, thank you so, both so much for um, for coming and and maybe we can just describe a little bit about how what what is a long talk. Um, and how did it get started? Like, what what was the birthplace of it? Well, let me. I guess I'll first say, you know, that you know, America is going to be a better place, a better country when it lives up to its promise of, of justice for all, right? When it's free from the debilitating effects of systemic racism and white supremacy to hold us back and keep us apart. And I just think it's important, as you know, as you, as you hear about how this started for us, you know. We, we, there's a there's a there's a need for this. There's a need for this, and I'll let Kamal kind of talk about where the birth of it is. But I, I think when you, when people ask what is a long talk, it's a conversation that needs to happen. Mm-hmm. Conversation that is happening, and Kamal can kind of talk a little bit about how we got started. Yeah, uh, why? Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. So, I, our even though this conversation for us is less than twelve months old, and a long talk did not exist twelve months ago, it was literally just getting started around this time. It really goes back to me meeting Kyle on, on Hampton's campus. I showed up to, to college as a freshman. I was barely a teenager. I had advanced, skipped some grades, and just got to a point to where I was on campus trying to navigate and figure out I had the academic skills starting college at a really young age, but not having the people skills. And Kyle saw me. He's like, you know what? Quit going to the library so much. Come eat with us in the cafeteria. And, and- <laughs> <laughs> and he became a friend, a big brother to me, gave me books to read, and, and we formed a lifelong friendship. And so as as we went on out into the world, Kyle got married, had three sons. I got married, had daughters, and just 
we lived our lives, but we shared these. I, I went to Plainfield, New Jersey, the birthplace of P-Funk, Kyle's <laughs> mom, like built lifelong friendships, right? We had these moments. And you, when, when you have friends for life, really family, a brotherhood, when George Floyd was murdered, I, I, I was in pain. And I, I called my, my brother and I, I was I was I was in pain. And, and, and I want to say this just out front that I, I have not watched George Floyd die when he hmm. was murdered. Anytime the video would come on, I would turn away. I still to this day. I, so for me, though, living in, in Georgia, I knew what the expectation was on that Zoom for my work the next day. There, I knew just like with Trayvon Martin, Sandra Bland, Mike Brown, there would be no acknowledgement. I would, hey, where's the spreadsheet? It would just be a conversation like nothing happened. And I, I was pissed because it keeps happening over and over again. Mm-hmm. And so I literally called my, my, my big brother, someone who, who, who many, many years ago had looked out for me. And I, as I said before, you all have people that in your life that you share moments with and have conversations with. And I just said, Bro, I said, Kyle, I'm, if there's no way I'm going to show up tomorrow and pretend like nothing happened. I'm not going to just, just it, it keeps going. This this is this is just, I was fed up. And so I'll let Kyle go for me because he can share. I had no idea what he was going to say or what he had been working on. Huh. I gave you all that backstory because this brotherhood, this is two black fathers who went to a historically black college, HBCU, Hampton University, who formed a friendship that years later had no idea how what this was but i knew that my teenage daughter wasn't paying in my house my wife i knew my friends and family this was a talking point and i was and, and, and i was reaching out to to have this conversation with my big brother mm. I'll, I'll let you go from there yeah and so when kamal called me i was dealing with it in dc i'm in dc the father of three sons and, and you know two of my sons are in college one is in the ninth grade my, my sons play basketball in college and so we were we were in D.C. and when 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 it happened, when George Floyd was murdered, the next weekend they wanted to go to the protests, and their mother did not want them to go to the protests. Mm-hmm. It was COVID. There were rubber bullets. It was not a place she wanted them to be, and she just said, "Will you just go with them?" So no no problem. So I went down to the protest right in Lafayette Square Park on that first weekend, and it was it was emotional. It was everything that you know. I mean, it was flashbangs and rubber bullets. It was protests. It was. It was everything. Um, and as we were coming home from that, we were just kind of quiet, driving in the car. And then my, my son, Elijah, just started cursing in the back seat. And I'm like, what's wrong? What's the problem? And he's looking back at his post that he had made throughout the day, you know, going through a post on social media. And one of his teammates from school was reposting Tucker Carlson underneath his post. Mm. And so he was he was upset, you know, it was, there were just comments being made and he was like, hold on a second. And so he started to kind of text and, you know, they were kind of going back and forth. And I said, just, you know, call him. Maybe, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's a misunderstanding. Clearly not today. Like that's not today. Right. Uh-huh. But um, he called them and it made, it got, it got worse because they FaceTime uh-huh. each other. And uh-huh. so now there's a confrontation. There's literally a FaceTime fight going on with both my sons and this, and this, cause the kid wouldn't back down. He didn't have any, it didn't, it didn't matter. Um, but it became very confrontational, like seriously, mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. like really confrontational. <laughs> All right. And so I, I sat there and I was just kind of trying to kind of digress from digress from the day. So I was trying, I just kind of was like, whatever. I mean, whatever. It was just up in the air. But then I thought about this coach who was in the middle of this because the next day they were going to have uh, a Zoom call mm-hmm. on a team. And so I knew my son was going to show up with the same energy that he had on that call and i wanted to prepare the coach so i texted him i said coach you should call me you should you should call me tomorrow before your zoom call let's talk about what's going on and he called me that night he called me right back to his credit he called me and he said is it a good time to talk it was not a good time to talk <laughs> I, I was i had never talked to this man it's just like just like elijah had never talked to that kid around about race or politics i had never talked to him so a side comment from him could have taken us back to this having the same conversation Right. So I didn't know if it was a good time to talk, but I said, let's have, let's talk. And we talked and he listened to me talk for 10 minutes about a pain and an agony and a, and a, and a frustration that I couldn't even hardly put into words, but that I wanted him to feel that I mm-hmm. understood really couldn't. Cause like, come on, I've never watched George Floyd. That is no way I can watch eight minutes of that of a black man's life being choked. There's no way I've never mm-hmm. even glanced at it. I can't, but when I when I shared with him what was going on with me, I, I understood that he wanted to hear me. He was a good guy, 
but he didn't understand what I was talking about. Like we got off the phone, I, I realized he didn't know what I was talking about. He mm -hmm. and he didn't. It wasn't that he didn't want to know. He just didn't know. Mm -hmm. and so you know, I, I kind of thanked him for listening. Didn't think much would change, but then we started talking a little bit, texting, and then someone gave me a video, a link to a video. A friend of mine gave me a video link to the history of race in America, uh, a, a lecture by uh, Jeffrey Robinson, and I shared that with the coach. And I said, Coach watch this. And if you really want to talk about what I was talking about, watch this stuff and then let's talk. And he watched it and then halfway through blinders started coming off his, his, his head and he started realizing he literally texted me back WTF. Like, what is this? Because he didn't know about redlining and the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. He didn't know about mm -hmm. the Tuskegee. He didn't, he didn't know about these things. He didn't know about the true Confederacy and all. He didn't know about that stuff because he hadn't learned about it in his history books. Mm -hmm. And so when, I, when he understood that, he immediately realized what I was saying the day before, and he immediately became an active anti-racist because he wanted to make the world better for my son and safe for my son and for people and, and to make a better union, like Kamal said. And so mm -hmm. that's how it literally started as a conversation. It wasn't a, it's not a DEI program. It's not a, it's literally a conversation that is activating people and helping and understanding why things need to change and need to change now. So I know that's a long, long answer to that question, um, but it is, that's the origin story of where it led because, you know, and I'll even add that after I talked to my son at Gettysburg, that's at Gettysburg College. Well, as I said, I have another son that goes to the University of Pennsylvania. So I sent them the video. Like, I needed to talk about this. And so that's when that conversation, then he started writing articles in the media. It starts to, you know, I, I recognize that my two sons were safer. So my, my immediate goal, I, yeah, right, so there were there were so many points. I mean, first of all, thank you for sharing that and for responding the, with generosity. There was so much generosity in the way that you responded at each step of what happened that, uh, you know, I'm in awe of the generosity when your son was in pain and that moment that you said, well, call him like that, that, that generosity in that moment is in, incredibly powerful. And that, and, and that even when he responded in the way that was still causing pain and, and harmful, that you continued to show up with generosity and, and, and sitting in, in the pain of it and not shying away from it, that allows us to, to move the conversation forward. Um, and then you talked about activation and, and that we really can't change unless we're activated. Right. And so thinking about that activation piece, that emotional activation and, and Kamal, I heard, heard in your story as well, the, just the, the visceral pain that you were holding in that moment and that you reach out to your brother for connection, that we need that sense of belonging connection. And I'm, I'm curious how you were able to come to such a generous space to be able to to bring the conversation in a way that could be hurtful <laughs> wow that's a that's a my, my mother once said that i found a way to turn my rage into something helpful because when you when you describe it like that that's a very that's that's that was a deep description i didn't I never, i've never thought of it that way because i was trying to keep my sanity mm. I don't think I was, I don't know if I was being generous or gracious. I was trying to make sense of a world that wasn't making sense. How could this child, how could this person post that under my child's post on today mm -hmm. at this moment? What would bring him to do that? I said, that doesn't make sense. So let me try to figure out the lesson and try what I got to, I had to figure it out. So it's great. Mm -hmm. I love how you put it, but I want to make, like, it was a, I was at a place. I was at a, I was at a place that I was either going to do something really, really good or really, really not so good. Mm -hmm. And maybe that was my, my mother talks about it. Maybe that was the grace that was just on me at the, in the moment. Cause that day was not the day. It was just not mm -hmm. the day. So I'm glad I, I, I'm thankful that I could have found some, that generous spirit in that, because you're right. That, that was, but it was more of me trying to give the world one more chance today. I'm trying to give y'all one more chance today. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Go ahead, come on. No, can, can I just say this? Because I, I feel like as black people navigating white supremacy and racism, daily mm -hmm. we have to pick and choose how much venom we let remain internally mm -hmm. and how we get that out externally if it's through jogging if it's through playing sports or listening to music or or conversation whatever that is and so for me i have felt like i had this shield i learned how to wear this armor through life to protect my internal organs and my and my, me my mental health mm -hmm. but 
this when George Floyd was murdered, that my armor was pierced, and I had to call my big brother and say, "Hey, look, I, I try, help me make sense of this, right?" Because um, you're you're right to be generous in that time and, and to look for for how do I get back to peace and maintain my peace, so that I can survive and be here for for my legacy and 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 not let this what I experience daily, monthly, weekly, yearly eat me up from the inside out. So so I, I was looking to a, a return to peace. Mm. And, and maybe that's that's a mechanism that we've learned as survival, but I don't know, Kyle. I, 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 Susan, I, <laughs> Megan, that, that's, I'm just reflecting on what you're saying. I've never looked at it or even anyone's even asked from that perspective. Yeah. Well, I appreciate what you said too, Kamal, around wearing an armor, right? And what we, what we, what we do, especially African-American people must do to survive every day, right? Like you, you can't live in that rage every day and continue to be productive. And, you know, like that's, you know, so I, I'm, what I'm hearing from you is like a, a coping mechanism. And, um, you know, I tried to describe that to my son once when he was mad that a game was unfairly refed, and I was I likened it to to racism, and I was like, right now that's every day for people of color in this country, every day, and we have to find a way to work. Like we have to work with that, but you can't be in this. You know, he was just outraged and angry and storm. I'm like this. You know, we need to find another way. Um, and, and, and the rage is also there and needs to be there. And I, I guess I think for me, um, you know, I think what happened with George Floyd, just the, the length of time, how it was like, how clear it was that, that this wasn't appropriate, right? Like this was, this man was being killed in front of everyone's eyes, um, uh, unnecessarily. I think pierced a lot of people's armor, um, all over the place, so so that that they're they're you know, so you can't hold that back in in that moment. It's just so compelling. You can't hold, you can't kind of put at bay, you know, or push away the visceral response to watching a man be killed in that way, um, and and then remembering. And you guys started rattling off names, and we could rattle off names. Could be here all day rattling all day, names, right? So, um, so I think there was something about George Floyd that pierced a lot of people's armor. Um, white people too. So I think, as you were saying, Kyle, you're talking to, I'm, I'm assuming the coaches you were talking to were white identified. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of like wanting to understand, but not getting it right. Cause, mm -hmm. cause what we walk through so many of the things that white people experience, we just don't see it. Want to, <laughs> I want to, right. I want to understand, but I can't possibly understand. And a lot of people, if they haven't been doing their homework or haven't been, haven't been actively anti-racist, just genuinely don't know the other story of what's going on in the world, what other people's experiences are. Um, so for me, I just think so much of what your story and the origin of a long talk just brings that forward of just of the pierced armor um, and showing up in this moment um, in the pierced armor and finding those connections. So I just think it's really profound. No, I hope, I mean, I hope that if, if nothing else, that that pierced some armor. Um, I think, you know, when we think about, you know, I, I've asked people the question, I know when the trial went through and people were, wor were worried or about what might happen. Like, there was still, people were not 100%, black and white, not 100% mm -hmm. sure mm -hmm. that it wouldn't happen, right? And so you think about that for a second. Mm -hmm. That in order for us, we not even having security about that verdict, but in order for us to have that verdict happen, the entire world protested that, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. act. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ever before has there been a protest that that's in, that connected continents before? Every now. continent, right? There was every, there were protests on every continent. every continent. So think about it. So you had to have nine minutes of video. You had to have a, a man screaming for his mother, his dead mother. You had to have a, entire continents protest for a year for us to say, I think we're going to get this one. I know. And yeah. so when you think about, when you talk about this, you know, the race, James Baldwin has a quote, you know, to be a Negro in this country and to be relatively conscious is to be in a rage almost all the time. Mm -hmm. And so when you really think about, like, I hope it pierced some armor. I, I really do, because there, if there's still armor up against this and these type mm -hmm. of actions, then that's, then that is, that's battleground material. Like that's mm -hmm. somebody deciding to not just be ignorant, but to wear armor to, to go against that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the space that we're in. That's what I, I, the one thing I do love about now 
is that people are the ignorance you can't the ignorance this is a war on ignorance right now yeah. it's an age of enlightenment yep. it's a new yep. one yeah. so so you cannot claim ignorance anymore anyone yep. who chooses to claim ignorance about tulsa after this weekend and i've mm -hmm. chosen to do that like you're no longer ignorant you have chosen a space of no of lack of knowledge or of right. so it's important for us to move in in the space that we're in right now to figure out how to make all that come together and connect because we have to like if not now i don't i don't know how many more times we're going to revisit this conversation so we are up at our first break it's, <laughs> it's hard to break because it's oh, just so important and powerful um, time, and, time. and it was a, it was great timing because <laughs> i think you're, that 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 issue of you can no longer claim ignorance i i, no. I think is is a really important point and that we can pause on that and come back and continue to talk about now that ignorance is no longer uh, ex an excuse that can be used. Where do we go from here? What 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 is a long talk doing to be able to help uh, move this conversation forward? So we hey, listeners, are you enjoying this show? And do you want to hear more? Then please subscribe to our show on your favorite streaming platform. Like this show and tell others about us. We are available on CastBox, Deezer, Podcast Addict, Podchaser, uh, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, and Apple Podcasts. So please connect with us there. You also can watch shows live being recorded on our Facebook site, The Awakening Educator. You can connect with us via Instagram or Twitter at The Awakening Educator. And you can also subscribe to our newsletter. Uh, we've been busy recording a ton of terrific shows that we'll be rolling out over the rest of this year. So we would love to be able to have you be a regular member of our community. Thank you so much and have a great, great day. Hey, well, welcome back. Um, yeah, cool. so Susan, when we before we went on break, you said, you know, um, right, this is a moment. And, and I agree, Kyle, this is no more can people claim ignorance to, you know, and, and not just George Floyd, but it was George Floyd followed up you know, many individuals before George mm -hmm. Floyd. And then immediately afterward, you know, again, we can name a lot of names that followed yeah. afterwards. Dante um, Wright, Breonna Taylor. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and, and yeah. And not just, you know, by police and not by police. So mm -hmm. uh, I think the benefit of this year, if nothing else, and everyone being home and COVID and, and having, having so much coverage of these murders is that it's, it's not a one-off. It's not a, you know, just a, an mm -hmm. isolated incident. It is a pattern and people and the scales are coming off people's eyes. So now that they're coming off, or at least the opening is there, what does the long talk do there? Well, you know, we recognize that, you know, today it's just not enough people that have learned the extent to which our country was founded on racism and systemic oppression. They, they don't realize that racism goes far beyond individual attitudes mm -hmm. and uses uh, American institutions to this day. Mm -hmm. um, some know the history. Some people do know the history, but they're stuck in a place of seeing themselves as just personally not racist, right? And just not sure what to do. And so what a long talk does is we're, we're an initiative that provides the tools for someone to be a vocal, effective anti-racist at home, at work, in the community. It's a powerful, transformative, journey really that we go through where the stolen history is talked about open honest discussion to be able to touch on different points we're giving them tools to fight this these conversations and to push back and to use uh you know the, the, their voice for good and so mm -hmm. as we look at a long talk as an experience that provides ongoing support so even going through our conversation but then joining our community is open, it's even bigger than that um so I, we, we can i mean it's really something it's hard to, to describe you know, because it's something you experience. It's not a checkbox DEI program. It's an experience. It's a conversation that is living, that's active, that's going on all around us right now with our, with our, with our participants. Over 1,500 people have gone through it in the last year. Um, we've had, and, not, and I, say, I don't even want to say success because we're just getting started. So it's not, it's about, we've had some incredible success stories um, that are where people are being activated and energized. So that's, that's what we're building. Kyle, I, I did want to say that it's important to note that it's an active learning community. It's not, we just mm -hmm. don't together, read books, watch movies. We do have a component where we have book discussions, movie discussions every month. We ask our community members to watch a movie, look at it through a different lens. and, and, and um, But 
beyond that, we challenge our community and we support our community with what are we going to do with this newfound information? Mm. Not just say that I understand what it means to be anti-racist, but how do I exercise and do something on a local, national, and international level? So yeah, I definitely want to point that out is that we have many touch points. It is a learning community, but it's an active learning community. When we learn, we expect our team to step up and look around and say, hey, look, we need to do something. Wherever my space is, wherever my front line is, I can be the change. And, and I can, I can, even if it's small, it doesn't matter. One action, one more action, Amplify becomes, it grows exponentially. Well, I appreciate that. And, and Kylie, you said it's not another DEI program. And, and frankly, I've gotten quite impatient with seeing the number of DEI programs that are being put out. I feel like you turn around every day and someone's like, yeah, we were offering a DEI program. And, and what I've seen most of the time, and I imagine you two have as well, it's a little bit of a one and done moment. It's not really, um, it's not really actually you know, you can't do DEI in a one and done, um, you know, or packaged program. Um, it, it requires conversation. It requires ongoing investigation. I love that you share different resources for folks to look at and then talk about together because the conversation, this is what I meant in the beginning when I said it's so simple and so profound, like mm -hmm. conversation is the thing. Mm -hmm. And we have to be willing to step up and make mistakes and ask questions and be curious and be pushed. Um, and you can't do that quickly. Um, it's, mm -hmm. you know, I often say to Susan, you know, I, 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 I discovered that I was a white person with privilege at 21. So, you know, and so 27 years later, you know, I'm still discovering that I'm still figuring that out. I'm still working with that. I'm still making mistakes. I'm still trying to, um, understand more. And I had the benefit of some of those long talks. I happened to have some really wonderful, had a wonderful teaching partner. Um, who had those long talks. I mean, we had long talks every day and I absolutely mm -hmm. credit him for a lot of the reasons why I am as aware as I am and still missing some things along the way for sure. But it, it's a conversation and it can't be done quickly um, and it can't be transactional. Um, so I just wanna, I just appreciate that. And it's one of the things that makes me so actually really concerned in this moment. Cause I think when we have these quick one on done, one and done conversations, it causes more harm. It makes everyone feel exposed and uncomfortable and open in a way that, and then if that doesn't get taken care of, just deepens those scars. There's a couple of things that I'm curious about. I mean, there's many things I'm curious about, but things that are coming up right now. And um, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about the brain and trauma. Uh, I do a lot of training around trauma and I've been training with Dr. Bruce Perry for the last couple of years. And, and I always start with the understanding that trauma is both historical, systemic, interpersonal and individual, right? We, we have to look at it from this perspective and really thinking about racism. And, and I was thinking about what you said, Kyle, around ignorance, right? You know, you can no longer claim ignorance. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of that is like kind of held in the thinking part of the brain we can change that we can we can teach you the history we can we can have those conversations but the deeper stuff the stuff that's like really deeply rooted and in, in the lower parts of our brain and the in the in all of those little microaggressions and all of those little moments and all of the mis uh information that is fed to us through media through our parents through culture and through white supremacy that is invasive and pervasive everywhere that those things are much more difficult to unroot and undo. And even when you think you got them, they, they find their way back, back in. <laughs> they, they weave back in. So I'm curious, like from this ongoing standpoint and the long conversations that you have, how do you continue to keep safety, as Megan was saying, make sure people are not being put in positions where they're vulnerable and harm, but that they are vulnerable and open in a way that feels healing and ongoing. So that's, that's a great question. I think is first thing is, as Kamal talked about, our community. Hmm. We, on day, so at the end of each day, we have a reflection board. We give to the group, they give reflections, just to, you know, just to get it out, to say what they need to say. They can be anonymous posts or just a, a pilot board. And what we find is that day one is a very heavy lift at the beginning of our conversation. And everybody goes through that to feel those feelings and feel the vulnerabilities and they shared or they didn't share what they put in the chat, all the different things. So as we take them through the three days, 
there is a there's a different reflection at the end of each of those days you, you see because we're putting the time in like megan said it's not a quick we're going to show you this for two hours give you a checklist you're going to feel better no because we're taking you through a, a day of a, I mean, we're taking you through a conversation 24 hours or a week to reflect another conversation 24 hours or a week to reflect day three so the process alone is healing mm -hmm. because if you, if you decide to keep showing up then you decided and you're, and you're getting what you need to get from it to take you through it because here's the thing at the end of the three days we invite you back again and we invite you back again and we invite you back again and we invite you back again with all your new friends who are going through the same exact thing you're going through mm -hmm. here's the thing that that where the, the disconnect of with the other your other point about we give people the information and they're no longer ignorant about it but what makes it stick or what makes it meaningful and and the word that comes out for me is empathy mm -hmm. you see people can people people go through you know can i i don't i can't understand this i can't white people can understand racism mm -hmm. just like you can understand calculus uh -huh. you just study it you learn you find the facts you find the applications you figure it out so we can understand it experiencing is different experience is where the disconnect with empathy comes from it's hard to but when you want to put yourself in it when i say experience it through the music we have music as part of our resources our soundtrack when you can connect with the soul of the issue that it's not just a piece of paper but it's a life behind every one of these stories when you mm -hmm. when you start to connect with the empathy of it now you become a changed being now now your mind and your heart get involved and then your hands get involved and you start to do stuff mm -hmm. you know so we that's what we promote you know we're, we're not we're not we're not it's not a, it's not a got we don't want you to show up and say ah look what's going on that that's not going to help anybody mm -hmm. we're trying to learn how to heal this country through a conversation and through actions that support reversing the effects of these these things that have happened and whoever mm -hmm. wants to be a part of that that joins that we're all building i'm i have learned and grown this is not something i had in the pocket i've been waiting to show people mm -hmm. and i'm an expert on i never talked to this many white people before in my life <laughs> Well, that's a good point. I mean, I'm wondering about that, Kyle. Uh, you know, I mean, I think, and, I, and I've heard this from other people of color who I've worked with around bringing diversity and equity inclusion initiatives forward, that it actually can be incredibly challenging to work with white people as they're coming to understand the impact of bias, racism, white supremacy in this country. And it can be really, really painful, draining, enraging i mean i can give all sorts of adjectives around it so I, how do you both hold that space um and continue to show up for that conversation um you, you gotta you want, you want that on? so we love when we get on on our calls and work with our community i mean mm -hmm. it would be kyle and i would have passed out i mean we're spending hours and hours of our lives within these conversations this these past 11 and a half months because for us it's empowering it's a two-way it's not a yelling match it's it's a discourse that we believe will form, i know it sounds corny a more perfect union but we see it's interesting when you have someone who may have gone through a long talk from last september and every month we we're asking hey watch this movie let's let's meet up and let's talk about the united states versus billy holiday let's talk mm -hmm. about concrete cowboys Let's mm -hmm. talk about when they see us. Why don't you guys read cast and let's talk. So we're seeing people that we're building friendships with that we would have never met. And I always tell them this. If my grandmother had seen this, if my, my mom would say, you know what, come on, it's going to take generations to fix, be patient. My grandmother would say it will take generations to fix. But to see all these faces on a Zoom call, people from all different backgrounds, athletic directors, professors, mm -hmm. engineering, like, People who are in our community, mayors, retired police chiefs, to see these individuals working, learning together, it's inspiring. It's it's hopeful. Mm. Because for a long time, as black, we, we felt like it was just us. We didn't know who we could trust. Mm -hmm. We didn't we didn't know who was going to show up and really work. But when we see people showing up from last year, every month, having these conversations just for an hour, it was a lunchtime discussion on reparations or or one of our talks is why you can't touch my hair. And we had a professor from University of Washington. We have these conversations, but these are people that we're meeting and it's empowering both ways. It's not just a one-way street. So Kyle, I know I went off on a tangent a little bit, but that-, that No, that's helpful. That's it, great. Because it's it's something I wondered about because I, I just know that for some folks, it just becomes too much. Um, and so it's helpful to hear that, um, that for, you, for the, this is an empowering experience. 
So I give, and I, and it is, uh, and when we show up and our, and we're there, it is, it is so much. It is very much an empowering experience. But I, but I do recognize the other side of that, and I and I think I talk to people who literally say, "You're doing what? For how? What? Like, like <laughs> personality? They don't have personality. Like you, what?" And what I realized, one of the things I learned early in this was there was a quote from Denzel Washington on Twitter one day, and it said, uh, um, "Everything changed when I realized you are my lesson and not my enemy." Mm-hmm. And for me, mm-hmm. it changed actually the whole course of a long talk, but it also changed my 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 approach to this. And when I realized that people that I can engage in a conversation where I'm trying to learn how to best help you understand what you need to understand, I'm a teacher. I've been a you know, my educator first, so my idea is I have a think of it this way: you have a classroom of people at all different levels, but who really, really want to hear what you have to say, that really, really want to engage every single day. And so if you show up for that classroom as a teacher, if I'm a teacher, I know I go to work every day and I know my kids are engaged. They're going to be there. They're going to be attentive. They're going to participate. They're going to put stuff in the chat. They're going to feel the emotion. They're going to go through all that. I don't have to be frustrated with them. So I don't have to deal with a lot of what other people are dealing with trying to help white people. That's much more frustrating than mine. I couldn't do what a lot of people are doing as DEI people in mandatory settings. Mm-hmm. Like one of the best things about our program is it's, I would never have it be mandatory. We don't, wherever we go, it's not mandatory. I don't want to talk to everybody. Everybody doesn't want to talk to me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Everybody, I don't want to talk to everybody. So that's fine because we don't need everybody to end racism. We, we didn't need everyone to stop smoking to, to push secondhand smokers outside. Mm. We didn't need them, right? So it's fine. Mm-hmm. The ones that show up, we will work with. But the, the idea of keeping your mental health together around having this conversation. It's about that that quote from Denzel gives me patience when mm. I did with, with white people. And here's the thing, I don't necessarily do the heavy lifting. I show up and say what I have to say and give them a break to reflect and do their homework. Mm-hmm. Well, a lot of it is, I don't, it's like, I, just like a teacher, I don't have to go home with them and do the homework. I'm gonna show up tomorrow and give my lesson. And then the heavy lift really is on is on them. And I'm gonna support exactly what, what they need, so. I, pre- I mean, I, I definitely, I, I, as an educator myself, I saw the organization of a long talk and I was like, oh, that's a person who's been a teacher. <laughs> like it's, mm-hmm. it's very, th- I mean, in, in, in the best compliment possible that I think um, you have a way in the program of laying out information that builds skills over time, um, that helps people to be able to start to understand the concepts that are being shared. And I've seen a lot of, a lot of professional development in my day, DEI as well, where that like those connections get missed and therefore it gets hard for folks to connect. So I just want to, as a teacher, say that I, I love seeing what you taught, but also the fact that there's an open and ongoing invitation to continue to connect, I just think is really powerful. Yeah. The other thing that you mentioned is the trust, right? That, that trust, cause people keep coming back on their own and that they're voluntarily. And when you have that, it, it makes it easier to open up and it, it, it provides the safety and foundational piece you need in order to offer grace and accept grace. Um, grace has been a word that's really been on top for me lately. And I'm not, you know, no, me it, too. Good. It, it feels really <laughs> resonant right in this moment, right? Because we all need grace. Um, you know, as a white woman who has worked my entire career in communities of color, who, as a mental health provider. And I think when you talk about the scaffolding and education primarily, but when, when you think about both education and what you, you have done in creating safety and relationship and belonging and activation to the emotional visceral piece of this, right? This is visceral. I think as Kamal said at the beginning, we, we feel it in our whole body and and as a, as a white woman, I cannot understand the visceral experience of, of being uh, a person of color in a world that is white supremacist, but I, I can feel visceral pain in the relationship with the people that I love and care about. Um, and so recognizing that what you've done is create this space where people can be in real relationship and authentic relationship and real connection and offer grace to each other as you learn through and wade through the historical torture and trauma uh, that this country is founded on. It's really powerful. Well, it lives, it lives in the body, right? So I think yeah. there's plenty of evidence now that, you know, historical trauma also lives in the body. So, mm-hmm. so it is very much a bodily experience as well as one that's mental. Um, we're at our, our break point again. Um, mm-hmm. And when we come back, what I'd, I'd love to talk about is 
I know there's an action part. So you're saying you're making activists and I, I love, it's the other part of what I love about, you know, I think it's in your mission statement around, you want know, anti-racist at every dinner table. Um, so I think that it would be great to hear about that part and how you're, how you, and, I, and you mentioned it already a little bit like, now what are you gonna do about it? Um, yeah. That's another piece that often gets lost. So when we come back, I'd love to hear about how you're turning your participants into activists. Are you ready to change the way we do school? Yeah, me too. This is Megan Sweet from The Awakening Educator, and I've designed programming that empowers educators to reimagine how they approach their work. The pandemic has laid bare what most of us already knew. Our schools are under-resourced. Our system is set up to fail our most vulnerable students. Our educators are burned out and overwhelmed, and we all deserve better. With almost 30 years in education and 15 dedicated to leading school reform, I have been there and I get it. I've sat in the same seats that many of you have. I've been a classroom teacher and a school administrator. I've led district, county, and statewide reforms. I've coached dozens of teachers, principals, and executive leaders, and I've partnered with students, parents, and community activists. I have the scars from a lifetime of scrapping out in education, but also the lived experience that change is possible. After facing the prospect of quitting education myself, I began a journey to understand how I could stay in the profession I love, but do it in a way that was sustainable. Here's what I now know. It begins with self-care. Prioritizing ourselves can feel counterintuitive for educators, but when we give, give, give without attending to our own needs, eventually we run out of resources and burnout ensues. But when we stop finding the system and instead look inward for the answers we seek, we live more empowered lives and are better able to create the educational settings where our students will thrive. Here's what I also know. We already have the answers inside of us, we just sometimes need help getting them out. And that's where I come in. I love supporting educators to find their inner voice and match all those school smarts with their innate instincts about what works best for students. My superpowers are listening well, synthesizing ideas, and breaking complex processes into understandable and accessible parts. How will we do it? It all starts with doing what I call self-work, dedicating time and attention to building a relationship with ourselves. We do this in a course I call the Beliefs Lab. By the end of this course, you'll understand why self-care is essential for being an effective educator, and you'll have strategies you can use right now. You will also get a handle on some of those beliefs that are helping you and those that are getting in the way. The next step is doing the schoolwork, leading classroom and school change. In the course I call The Cycle, you will learn a process for realizing goals for yourself and for your educational context simultaneously. You will also have deeper insights and strategies for putting your plans into action. Want more support as you engage in the self-work and schoolwork? I've got you covered. My personalized coaching and consulting services are designed to meet you in your school right where you are and support you to clarify your vision for the future. Want to know even more about what I do? My book is a great place to start. An Educator's Guide for Using Your Three Eyes details the self-work and schoolwork that I described above and talks about concrete ways that you can start to feel better right now. If you want to learn more about how to work with me and the courses I just described, please come to my website www.your3eyes.com. That's Y-O-U-R, the number three, E-Y-E-S.com. I can't wait to support you to realize a better future for yourself and for your school community. Welcome back. Uh, we are so excited to have Kyle and Kamal of A Long Talk. Uh, we were talking about how it lives in the body before we went on break and really looking into what is the action step. And, and I, I also wanted to link it to what Kamal said earlier around like we move and dance and sports and physical activity to move some of this stuff through our body and uh, connecting it to the both the relationship piece. So I'm, I'm really curious about the action. Um, and Megan was asking questions about what are those action items? How do we engage our community to, to get involved? Okay. I think one of the first things that I realized with this is that, you know, action is an individual choice, right? And so when you, when you put, when you think about what I can do, you know, when I, when I talked to, when I told this story and I talked about BJ Dunn deciding that, you know, he was just going to do something. He was going to go make a change with the way they spent their money when they traveled. And, and so it was, it was 
a personal choice. And so for us, it's not a particular, our action plan is we, we give them things. We want to continue to spread the word. We want to continue for them to, to, to connect us with people that want to spread the word. But the individual action is step up to your own front line. Uh, right? one, of, one, of the, yeah. one of our themes is white people to the front. You know, when we're really talking about putting a dent in this, you know, and dismantling white supremacy, white people have to step up to the front of that. Uh-huh. Right. And, you know, whether you talked about names before, to be honest, black people have given enough blood, sweat and lives to destroy uh-huh. white supremacy. It's like we've done our we've done enough. Right. We will never stop. And, and that's, just, that's just who I'm going to be. So uh-huh. I, I want to add that our pillars of change program is the anchor. And that's that's part of our action piece, because after people go through the three day conversation with us, we invite them to join. Our, our pillars of change. And, and this is important because a lot of times the action sometimes there's people who are, who are absorbing a lot of information this past year. And it's, it's sometimes so much is not segmented. And so what we felt, and I'll let Kyle kind of talk about how our pillars of change program came about, but this is our, our touch point every month. And it's, once people finish a long talk, yes, we offer a discussion on books, quarterly movies, every month we do a movie discussion. Every month we have one lunchtime discussion, but this pillars of change is a large portion of our action piece because mm-hmm. of the way we have. It, it, Kyle, just take two. This is very important because this is what we leave behind. Just like Kyle said, we still have the conversation. People don't go through three days with us on a long talk, and and that's it. This piece here is, is deliberate and intentional. Kyle can explain to you how that is the onboarding or, or the launch pad for the action piece. Yeah, and so. With that personal responsibility, we want to provide structure for that. Like if you want to do, people just don't know how to just turn on the switch sometimes. So mm-hmm. if the pillar of change is it's like an, it's it's a monthly touch point that we do. Let me, let me back up for a second. When we were working with the University of Pennsylvania, we finished our conversation with them and, and we were going to continue to work with them, but they're like, what do we do? How do we stay organized? What is our point of contact? And I said, Well, instead of me, the POC, being your point of contact. Why don't you all become pillars of change in your community? And then we'll stay connected and you all begin the changes that, that you can that you want to see. And so through that conversation, we develop a curriculum of sorts, but it's more so just a guiding structure of information and conversation. And so every single month we meet um, one, one, one time with the group, uh, about 90 minutes. And we've had our group right now is about 90 people that are in the pillars of change program. Um, and so we meet once a month and we're going to talk about uh, one the first quarter of the year we did crime and punishment. So we go, we take a deep dive into crime and punishment, understanding it, reading um, the new Jim Crow, watching 13th, having conversations around it, um, and then being able to do some action points around, do you know who your DA is? Do you know, do you understand the, the, how the laws and people that are in place, if you have a sheriff, if you have, like, do you understand how the crime and punishment in your local area works? And so people dove in and, and did some research and, and understood who they were. For the third month that we do in that quarter, we had a guest speaker come in. Someone who was a former DA, went to school with Kamal and I at Hampton University, uh, Kenneth Montgomery, and is now a, 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 a criminal defense lawyer representing you know, death, death row cases. And he came and he spoke to him about what it really feels like in real life when there's, there's disparity in that. So that deeper dive just allows them to stay activated to then go do whatever they need to do. And what, I, what we mean by that, I'll give an example. Coming out of that first quarter, we always tell our folks to, to continue to let people know that we're here continue to invite people. We have a, a, a standing monthly community call that anybody can join us right on our website. You don't have to be connected to any school or any organization that we're working with. You can come on and get in our community call. We had some people that went through the um, the, the crime and punishment. And then on our next community call in April, and yeah, in April, we had a councilwoman from, um, from Atlanta, Georgia, mm-hmm. and the deputy chief of police from Atlanta, Georgia, went through a long talk because she activated, said, I'm going to use my voice and tell she started to work. And that's the kind of yeah. activism that we're talking about. It's not, you know, it's it ranges. People have a lot of buttons they can push, emails they can send, power they have, but it really comes down to being able to, wherever your front line is, just step up to it and then do what you can do. And, and, and Megan, it's important too, because each quarter, January, February, and March, that was crime and punishment. April, May, and June has been educational inequalities. We mm-hmm. always start just like our three-day format with a, a long talk. That first month, when we're dealing with that inequality, we it, it's a, a we're, we're looking at it from an informational perspective, right? The second month, we're coming in, we're practicing. How what can we do? I mean, can you write to your local school board? Can you? What, 
who, who, who do you know or what does it look like in your community? And the third month, we do have the guest speakers, but we also have the community share out because maybe one person did this in Pennsylvania. Maybe someone did this in Iowa. And in between that time, they're in a, a count of affinity groups, accountability groups of 10 to 12, all across the country, all professions, all these individuals are communicating off our call. They have their own little teams and they're figuring out what's happening in my area. What can I do? I mean, Kyle had this retired women in, in, in where is that Boca Raton who was meeting with the National Urban League? Like this, this, and who would have thought that would happen? And I don't know if I'm even telling him, like, but that Kyle, that's a byproduct of, of, mm -hmm. of yeah. One last thing, I'll add, just another piece I'll add to this to show you, you know, and I'm probably gonna, this is probably gonna put us, get us on, on somebody's radar tomorrow. Um, but we, we had a, a, there's a quote in one of my favorite movies, The Black Klansman, it says, anything's possible with the right white man, right? Mm -hmm. So we, not, that goes into this thinking of that whatever your front line is, whatever you can do to reach out, whatever you can do. So we, we spoke to someone that went through a conversation, a long talk, and I spoke with this person afterwards, and we were talking about stepping up to the front line. And this person was talking about how they were engaged in certain things and believing in certain things, but they didn't realize when they heard Coach Dunn talk about all black everything by supporting black businesses, that for the last six or seven years, they've single-handedly been in charge of their corporation's $180,000 hospitality budget. And so their thinking was, I spend this every year without, this is what I'm able to do. So why would not I divert some of this and not, mm -hmm. and, and, and spend some of this with black businesses? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. when you think about, that's not a front, I couldn't write that down and say, go into your, your mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> direct front. That's not going, I, that's, but that's, I have no idea the person we're talking to. So as they line up, it's literally like battery, let's go. Well, yeah. I, you know, there, there, I'm curious about, cause you, you, you started with sports and teams, right? You started with coaches and, and teams. And, and I was really surprised when you first told us the story that, I would think that teams would be places where some of those relationships that are happening across difference um, are changing things. But but from your story, it really wasn't that those conversations weren't happening. Young people were showing up and they were playing sports together, but they weren't really engaging across relationship. And there's so, there's so much money and um, structure that that sports brings in our country. And, and the money that you were just talking about, how powerful that is that a coach can make that decision around their budget and that, and that budgets across industries, including sports, um, can change the way that the structure of white supremacy happens in this country. And so how, how can smaller, so you're doing this at the division one universities, prestigious schools around the country, as well as local schools, how can maybe we encourage coaches and high schools coaches at middle schools, coaches on Papuana and all of these other spaces where young people, it's some of the few diverse spaces that kids are coming together, but they show up, they play sports and they go home into their neighborhoods. And I'm wondering, is there a conversation about bringing this to a younger, earlier when the brains are still more malleable, when we can start to have these important conversations earlier? So I say yes to all of that because this conversation is for everyone. And so our on ramp was sports, but we have our, like for instance, when we start talking about young people, teens, we just did a we did we just did a, a session at the junior NBA conference. Mm -hmm. So this is sixth, seventh, and eighth graders and the people that support basketball at that level. Because the, the bottom line is, young or old, none of us are taught and prepared to have this conversation. Yeah. yeah. So because of that, there's no like there's no expertise even in having the conversation yet. We're literally building the expertise in having this conversation. And we've got to involve that at a high level. So, I think yeah. that's profound, Kyle, because I mean I think something that you said um that for me just resonates or I also just um for white folks listening, like number one, white supremacy is a white person's problem. Um, so I agree. And it's our job to dismantle that um, and to learn. Um, but also, I just love this concept of choose your front line and mm -hmm. do something because that takes the, it puts the onus back on the individual as well, right? So we have to, and, and I think for a lot of white people, the front line is acknowledging that we have bias in the first place. So that that's the front line that I actually, I talk a lot about and I've I talk about use of mindfulness and other things that help us to be able to even acknowledge for ourselves that we have a bias in there. 
in our minds that are that's showing up and how we're seeing or perceiving or experiencing other people. So I, I think often that's frontline number one. And, I, and um, Kamal, you mentioned that, like, right, you have to like work with yourself first. Um, and then what can I do in my community? What is what is within my power and my control to make a change? Mm -hmm. um, and no size, you know, so I love this idea of, of diverting money that you already have towards black owned businesses. Mm -hmm. That's a very simple, real and impactful decision. But everyone has lots of different places. You know, those front lines are different. Um, for me, I happen to be a school board member. So my front line, I get to speak um, at the school board on a regular basis. Um, but I think for each person it's different and it, and, it pro and it provides an opportunity, including within our own families, which again, this is this concept that to me, I think is so powerful, yep. which is like, and it's at the dinner table um, yep. like with our children, with our family members. I, I attempted to talk this weekend with one of my family members. Um, didn't multiple ones of us did, it didn't go super well, but we're, I'm committed to continuing to show up to that conversation. Did you use uh, the three-hour so. protocol? Did you use the three-hour protocol? I did not. I was, you know, it was, it was a close, see, I, this is probably why. <laughs> I'm just saying it, I'm just saying it works. I just, yeah. I jumped right in and I, I created havoc. It, but yeah, that, that's why, it, <laughs> but no, but that's the, but we're so conditioned to have this conversation one way, to either right. not have it at all or to have it at high octave. Right, and right. Deeply roots, right? Can and you that, share the protocol too? Can you share what that is with the protocol? We have to come when you come through a long talk. We get the protocol, <laughs> yeah. but essentially, essentially, is this as simple as this? You know, people people will argue facts, but they'll answer questions. And would you rather be in a conversation where you're arguing facts or just having someone answer questions? And right. so people just need to be accountable for their own thoughts, their own ideas, and they need to just own those ideas and then understand the impact of them. You know, one of the things you said about you said people have to recognize their own bias, and that's what I think. Like when someone asked me, "Well, do you?" We were doing the talk, and they're like, "I mean, we we're doing a kind of a sales meeting." And they said, "Do you do you talk about microaggression?" And I said, "Well, I kind of talk about white supremacy, and so I just feel like all that's going to fall under the umbrella, right, at some point." And so when you think about your bias, or your, your, I think if people, if white people look at it and say, "You know what? I just have a deficit of information and empathy on this issue." Mm -hmm. That's I just I'm going to approach it every day. Like every day, I'm, I'm going to find some new information and find something else that's going to resonate with my spirit about this. So mm -hmm. bias goes away when you have information and empathy. Mm -hmm. you know, I just think yeah. that's a good place to start with that. I'm dominating the conversation now. I'm hearing myself, but I want to respond to this too, which is um, what you're naming. You said two things that I think are really important, which is it's when we when we meet it with aggression, either to ourselves. Um, or to another person, it tends to shut us down. And we have good biological reasons for that too, fight, flight, free, like literally just our reasoning starts to shut down. Yeah. Uh, but actually what we wanted to do is have open doors and with ourselves as well. So I just love that in, in, inter, interpersonal um, reframe of like, what am I gonna learn? How am I gonna just, and for, you know, maybe I put a label of curiosity on that. How can I be curious and learn? Yeah. Um, and when we engage with others, I did try to be gentle, Kyle. I just didn't go well. But um, <laughs> I didn't say be gentle. So you can you can be very you can see the three hour protocol allows you to be forceful with your question. Yeah, you have to be gentle. You have to just ask challenging questions, and so yeah. that's the that's the skill. But okay, we'll, well, I did that. We're getting ready to start. So we're getting ready to start. Doing, <laughs> you'll you'll get an email. We're getting ready to start doing monthly practice sessions, two a month, one mm -hmm. one in the day, one in the evening, where our, our community is going to just show up and do three hour protocol practice, so that we can continue to use our voice. You have to practice this. You, you can't go practice. from not having the convo to then, because it represents we're not ready. We have to be ready. So I expect to see you at practice, Megan. Um, I wanted to, Shika is out there giving a lot of love um, and they are doing some of this work, Shika and Tammy on Create and Educate. So she was, um, I just wanted to recognize they are using their dollars, elevate authors of color at their school and elementary school and helping them learn how to navigate the systems to be able to get their books sold in elementary schools. And I think that's a perfect example yeah. of one of the ways in which the system wasn't necessarily trying to keep people out, but it does because of all of the systems that are there. And that was another example. And she's giving you a lot of love here on Facebook. So we are coming up on uh, the last five minutes of our long, it was definitely not long enough. We, we need to <laughs> be joining the conversation monthly. Um, I'm so incredibly humbled by the work that you're doing, the the wellspring of 
conversation that continues and continues to grow both virtually and in communities and, and bringing it to the local level as well as the national level. And I think that's what's making this really powerful is that it is simplistic, but it's, it's asking people to step up to their own front line. And I'm gonna continue to um, resonate on that and reflect on that because I have my own front line. So I have to leave this conversation. And I think that's the important thing is anyone who sits in conversation with you guys needs to be able to then walk away and say, okay, I better find my front line. Um, I've been challenged in a way that is a gift and so I'm going to step up to it. And uh, I'm, I'm wondering, in, in closing, um, if you'd like to share where folks can find a long talk, how they can get involved, how they can get training, um, how could they, they bring it to their organization? What are the ways to connect with you guys? I'm going to let Kamal answer that in one second. But I do, I do want to add one piece I left out. It's in your mind with the educators that, that are listening. Um, we just started, we, we talked about the institutions and colleges we worked with. We've been working with nonprofits, but we just started working with school districts and school systems. Mm -hmm. And so we've actually worked with, we had a call today actually with Chambersburg Area School District in Pennsylvania. Uh, we worked with uh, Charles City, Iowa, Martha's Vineyard Public Schools. Uh, I think we're in one more Quaker Valley in Pennsylvania. We're working with Shirley and we're working on programming year long TD um, with school systems right now. So if, mm -hmm. as Paul talks about how you can reach out and, and get, some, get information, that is something that we're excited about getting into my team was full of educators and we're excited about being able to have an impact in classrooms and in districts and all kinds of things with some really great programs. So uh, I'll let Kamal go take that. You know, I, I will say the having people go through a long talk is a foundational piece and you can find us on our website at alongtalk.com and our social media um, handle is alongtalk2020. So Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, alongtalk2020. And we chose that because we have a 15 year game plan to erase racism and dismantle white supremacy. And we started the clock at 2020. So we're at a long talk 2020. We post our information there. But what we encourage people to do is every month that community call that Kyle mentioned, if you have family, aunties, uncles, relatives, coworkers, you can send them to our website and they can join our community call. And, and that's impactful. We feel like that's helping you know, usher in a change. But in order for us to reach the masses, we don't have to remind you that when you saw January 6th taking place, there are millions of people who are, it's, it's just amazing what's been able to, not amazing, it's by design, it's intentional. Mm -hmm. And until we have productive conversation and we're able to take that conversation and, 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 take, and put action behind it, there are millions of people that are, some are deeply entrenched in, in their hatred, some are mis- some just, they, they don't even know what they don't know, and conscious and competent. And so in order for us to have these productive conversations, share with your friends and family and have them join our community call. But from a, a corporate level, if you have a VP, a CEO that you live next door to, or a friend who's in a decision-making position at an organization, we work with corporations, universities. We are in talks with Little League and national coaching organizations. That If you know decision-makers, put us in contact with them. Help us do a warm email introduction. You can contact us through our website, but we will talk to anyone conversation to educate to and hate. And so that that's that's on a, a bigger level. If you're if if there is someone in that seat that can push the button and say, hey, look, we have 500 employees show up or a thousand people show up. That's how we get to the new because the millions of people out here who who need this. And 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 that's our goal is to have an anti-racism and every dinner table. So that's just um that's profound i'm so grateful that both of you have been on i'm so grateful for your program everyone please check out a long talk um i love that find your front line um and start right there it's brilliant and i'm i want to I, I think that should be a t-shirt and then if it's a t-shirt i'm going to buy it so you know gotcha i'm not i'm not swag. i'm not good at designing things i'm just saying um, all right i'm, I'm after it we'll add, that to our, our tech, we'll add it to our checklist and racism get swag all right we're good that's yep. right there you go <laughs> um, Thank also you so uh, much. It's such also honor. we are uh so proud of this convert of being able to engage in this conversation and want to grow the conversation and talk about equity um, and awakening our education to be more um, inclusive and thoughtful and able to engage in complex, difficult, uncomfortable conversations. Um, thank you guys so much. So appreciative of joining us today. It was really a gift.
Thank yeah, you, thanks guys. everybody. We appreciate you for having us and using your voice and your platform to, to, to get it out. We appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Class is dismissed. Wasn't that fun? Susan and Megan are always happy to greet you on the next episode of The Awakening Educator. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Education is the foundation for a brighter future. Open your eyes to The Awakening Educator.